Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the book of First John, True Knowledge. I'm John Walker, and along with others, I'm sitting with Bruce Watsek, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, where are we in our study of the book of First John? Well, tonight, we're going to discover who the Antichrist is. I bet everybody be on the edge of their seat for that one. Uh, and also, we're going to describe what worldliness is. So those are two things we're going to cover tonight. But the letter that John wrote, and this is John, we think, the apostle, was written late uh, in the first century, one of the last letters written. Uh, this seems to be uh, what we would later know uh, as the heretical view of Gnosticism, uh, Gnostic coming from to know in the Greek Gnosis. They claimed to have special knowledge about Christ that contradicted what the apostles said. And it was really an attempt to make Christianity jive with the popular Greek philosophy of the time. And just like all popular philosophies, you know, no one believes those things today. But I think the same kind of problem that John was facing then faces us today. Uh, and that is that people are trying to remake Jesus into some sort of image that they want. And that was one of the fundamental errors. The Gnostics claim he didn't come in the flesh, claim he wasn't raised from the dead. Uh, they claimed all kinds of uh, things because it didn't agree with their uh, philosophy about the physical existence. Uh, but in my lifetime, I've just seen countless people uh, come up with all kinds of notions. Jesus was a cynic philosopher, uh, one of the more recent uh, fellows that did his own independent study and thought he could see behind the gospels. And in that he saw Jesus was a cynic philosopher. Uh, of course, this guy tended to be a cynic philosopher. So guess what? He looked back through the deep well of time to see Jesus and saw his own reflection in the well and claimed he saw Jesus. And so you, uh, you find rationalists uh, that look at the Bible. Oh, well, that, these are miracles. That can't be true. No, none of these miracles happen. So they take all the miracles out. And what Jesus do we have? And they have kind of a, uh, a social do-good Jesus. And so uh, a lot of people that are communist and socialist, they see in Jesus the ultimate uh, socialist that wants to make a better world. And uh, on and on, you could go with the kind of Jesus. I remember back in the 60s, uh, all of a sudden, the, there was the hippie Jesus that everybody the Jesus movement thought they discovered. And of course, all these Jesuses were, uh, there were elements of Jesus in them, but they reworked Jesus to fit into their own view of life. And anytime you change and the Jesus you present and teach differs from the Jesus we read about in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then you have perpetuated a lie. And so there are lots of people that have presented Jesus as in our day and throughout history that are not the real Jesus. And that's what John starts off with in First John. Look, I'm telling you what I saw. I'm telling you what I heard and what I literally touched. I experienced Jesus, and I am telling you what he taught. I am telling you what he did. Uh, and what I believe is consistent with my experience. And of course, the first area in which the false teachers had gone astray on, was on the mission of Jesus to save us from our sins. And they claimed they had no sin and did not sin. And anybody that's in such denial uh, that even though you could see in their life they're sinful people, and yet they deny it, how can these people be spiritual leaders? We have to be willing to confess our sin. And they were also haters. If you didn't go along with them, you didn't agree with them, uh, you dared to disagree with them and claim their views are not right, they didn't like you. They hated you. And John says, if you don't love the brothers, but you hate them, you're not of God. You claim you know God, but clearly you don't know the real God 
your knowledge about God is completely at odds with what the truth is. And so that's what John has presented so far. When we pick up in chapter 2 of 1 John, uh, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Bruce, what is the meaning of worldliness? If that's interesting, um, because that kind of comes out of a passage like this, being like the world. Um, and it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, people will come up with all kinds of extreme things like, you know, to be an authentic Christian, you've just got to disassociate yourself entirely from this world, try to live like in a monastery. Uh, you can't get involved in the normal things of life. Uh, that's their idea of not being worldly, which is not true at all. Um, and then, of course, other people come up with certain taboos. Like when I was growing up as a kid, you know, the worldliness was, uh, you know, going to the swimming pool. Um, it was going to the, to the movie theaters. Uh, it was going dancing, et cetera, et cetera. Like they could define worldliness in just uh, simple things you could or could not do. Uh, but all these things fail to really deal with that which the Bible would say is worldly uh, that needs uh, to be avoided. But to get a true sense of how John understands in this context what he means by the world, we look a little later in the letter in chapter 5 of uh, 1 John, verse 19. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So he's defining the world in this context as the world that's in rebellion against the reign and rule of God, that the evil ones, sometimes called Satan or the devil, that he is the one that is leading this great rebellion and therefore being worldly is participating in the rebellion against what the will of God uh, is for us. And so that's what worldliness is. But as he goes on to define it, he breaks it down into three basic uh, types of sin that I think is helpful for us to think through. Uh, but notice the key is the sin is in loving the world, this world system that's in rebellion against God. We need to be loving our brothers and sisters and loving God, not loving the world um, and the things that are in the world. What are the things that are in the world? Uh, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Um, so basically, the desires of the flesh, and this is, this is important to note, we have God-given natural desires. We have a God-given natural sexual desire, God-given natural desire to, to eat food, um, but it's when this desire gets out of control, and, and instead of it being expressed in a godly way, it's expressed in a ungodly way, then this desire goes from what God gave us to a worldly experience. And of course, we know there's a lot of sexual immorality, but then food too, you know, uh, we eat so that we can live. You can't live without eating, but we don't live to eat. That's the difference. So a natural desire, yes, does mean you don't enjoy food, but you don't live to eat. It's not all about the food, not all about the drink. Uh, it's not all about mood altering through food and, and, and drink, intoxicants, whatever. 
you know, people that are all caught up in that, uh, again, it's the excess in that and an attempt to escape reality uh, that is the sin. Uh, and then the desires of the eyes. Uh, Paul, we live in such a visual culture, um, you know, through all forms of media, we see all kinds of, so if you're, if you're open to it, you can see almost anything, uh, whether it's looking at gaudy houses, uh, whether it be uh, pornography, whether it be, you know, uh, any kind of excess of any kind, it's all visually available and presented in a way that can be enticing and attractive. And so we have to be aware that, you know, the ultimate truth about life is not how things appear. It's not about how you look. It's about who you are. That's what's important. But the visual thing wants to make us think it's all about presenting an image. It's all about appearing to be this or that. And that's not what it's all about. And so we can't give in to just being eye pleasers and getting caught up in that. And then the pride of life. Um, you know, this is the things that people brag about. For some people, it's their academic achievements. For others, it's their job title. For other people, uh, it's, you know, uh, that they're good musically or something like this. But they take great pride and brag about what they have accomplished and what they do and how important they are. But you know, ultimately, none of us is more important than anybody else. We're all just human beings. We come and live for a little while, and then we die. Um, and the only thing important about us is that we are originally created in the image of God. And if we can reestablish a right relationship with him, he's offering to us a whole new type of life that John refers to as eternal life. And he's calling us to live a full life, not a worldly life, not one in rebellion against God, but one that's in harmony with God. Uh, all these false desires are not from the Father, but the world. And what's wrong with the world? The world's in the process of passing away. I mean, think about it. At the time that John writes this, the Roman Empire has not yet reached its zenith. It's still growing. It's still capturing more territory. Uh, it'll be maybe another 100 years before it reaches kind of its zenith. And then it exists there for several hundred years. Then it has to reconstitute itself from Rome all the way to Constantinople and exists there until around 1500, when finally the Islamic Empire conquers the last remnants of the Roman Empire. Well, you know, you can see why people at that time might have been impressed with the Roman Empire. And it's interesting to read about it, to see archeology span about it, but what happened to the Roman Empire? It passed away. Uh, anything, that may seem really important that's worldly of this world, one thing is for sure, it won't last. It passes away. Oftentimes, I mean, just think of all the fads we've seen in our life, people get all caught up in, and two years later, nobody even pays any attention to. It. Just, you know, uh, one thing after another that captures people's attention, people get all excited about, uh, and then the next thing you know, it passes away. But if we are truly into that which is eternal, then we'll be into doing the will of God. Because when we commit ourselves to do the will of God, then we know we can abide, live, dwell, remain forever. Because that's that forever life that God is offering us. But the world is offering counters to the life of God. It's offering alternatives that are fake, phony, a lie, that just simply don't last, 
they'll always pass away. They're always in the process of corruption and deterioration. And so he's warning them, these false teachers are using the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life to try to entice people in their particular form of spirituality. But because it's of the world, uh, he says, we can't have any part of that. We've got to stick with the will of God because only people that are into the will of God as the revealed will of God, which is what the word of God reveals is God's will for us. That's what's important. That's where we need to invest our time, our energy, uh, and our lives. But let's just take a, a note, I think just be helpful uh, to see how these three types of worldliness uh, we see in the temptation the devil uh, gave to Christ himself that these three uh, temptations, lust of the flesh, uh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life were the three temptations of Christ. Let's look back in Matthew chapter 4 and read that account and notice it. Beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So notice uh, Satan doesn't have any new tools in his belt. He's got these three basic ways uh, to tempt anyone, no matter if you're the son of God or not. And after fasting for 40 days, you're going to be hungry. And the temptation was, use your power to feed yourself. You know, turn these stones into bread, uh, the lust of the flesh in this occasion. And then he took him up to a, uh, to a high place and said, jump down here and God's got to protect you. So this is the pride of life. You're so important, you can try to kill yourself and God can't let you do that. He'll protect you. Um, and of course, Jesus, in each occasion, quoted scripture to challenge uh, the satanic suggestions. And, the final, and, and here he comes up with the final one. The devil took him behind a mountain and said, I'll show you all the glory of all the kingdoms. I'll give it all to you. you bow down and worship me. So the pride of life, the visual effect, the lust of the eyes. So these are the same basic temptations that we are tempted with, Satan tempted Christ with, and Christ was able to see through them because he knew the word of God. He knew the truth, and he saw through each of these temptations was a false desire that would have been wrong to engage in, and instead he put his trust in God alone. And so finally, Satan was forced to leave after his temptations failed. But these same three temptations, they don't just go back to the example of Jesus. We can go back to the original one, back in the book of Genesis, when the serpent uh, tempts uh, Eve in the garden, and Genesis 3, verse 6, we have all three of these in one verse. 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So she saw visually that the tree was good for food. So it would satisfy this need, the lust of the flesh, and that it was a delight to the eyes. So this is very appealing kind of fruit on this forbidden tree. And then finally, the pride of life was that this tree could make one wise, uh, so, so wise that she'd be wise like God. So, the same three temptations were on Eve. Serpent used them there. When Christ came, he only had three basic temptations to try to tempt Christ to betray his mission. And of course, he succeeded with Adam and Eve, but he failed with Christ. That's why you and I have hope of eternal salvation. But he's still using the same basic ways of worldliness to try to lead us astray from a righteous life and a walk in the will of God. Um, let's look at the next section, verses 18 uh, and 19. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Bruce, what is, what is meant by this expression, antichrist? Very, very interesting. This is the only place in the Bible that it, this particular expression is used. Um, but the idea of antichrist means something that's antithetical to Christ or something that's opposed to Christ, something that's in literal Greek against Christ, not for Christ, but against Christ. Um, I find it very interesting. You have to keep in mind, this was written near the end of the first century. And by this time, he was able to say something that was not discussed earlier as much. And that is, there's not one antichrist. He says there are already a variety of them. So it wasn't that we're waiting for one antichrist to come, but that there already in the first century had been a variety of them that had presented themselves offering alternatives uh, to the way of the true Christ, the true Messiah. Um, now, I think to really understand this, we have to remember that Jesus was asked about the beauty of the temple, and he said, not one stone will be left on top of the other. It's all going to be destroyed. And his disciples said, well, when in the world is this going to happen? Uh, and Jesus went on to describe the situation in which the temple was going to be destroyed. And a lot of the things that mo people interpret as talking about the end of the world, end of times, was actually Jesus discussing when God was going to allow his temple in Jerusalem to be destroyed. And one of the things that he said in this was one of the signs to look for was like when prophet Jan Daniel talked about the abomination of desolation. Now you go back and read Daniel, uh, and the first reference to this was when a Greek king uh, came to Jerusalem. He was trying to change Jews, get them off of their Jewish perspective. So he went to the temple and sacrificed a pig on the altar, that which was unclean. But his attempt was to say, you're not going to worship God the way you have. I'm going to force you into a more Greek way of thinking. And a great revolution started. And the Jews fought against this Greek king and for a while gained independence for about 100 years until the Romans came and imposed their rule uh, on the Jews. But the point of that is that the abomination of desolation 
was when the temple was desecrated with the offering of a pig on the altar. And so uh, when we think about the first Antichrist, uh, we have to go back. Jesus had predicted this destruction of the temple, but Paul died before the Jewish revolution began in 66 AD, much less before it ended in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and desecrated by the Roman general who later became emperor and claimed by the time John wrote this to be a god, uh, Titus. Um, but to get a feel for this, while he was still alive, um, you know, Paul was answering this question about you know, the end time and what to anticipate. And he said something interesting in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. Uh, again, remember, this is prior to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And they're wondering, when is all these things, these apocalyptic things that Jesus said about the temple in the future, when is this going to happen? And so he tells us this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 through 4. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, you know, think about that. He's, he's defining a antichrist. And he said, what is this man going to do? He's going to proclaim himself to be deity above all deity, but the crowning effect of this man of lawlessness, thus in leading the, the revolt against God and claiming to be God, is that he takes his seat in the temple of God. There was only one temple of God, and that was in Jerusalem, and it was destroyed in 70 AD, and Titus, the conquering general, came into the temple. They offered, uh, again, false sacrifices to their gods uh, in the remnants of the temple, and then they destroyed the entire temple. All this left is the mount on which the temple sat, which is still there in Jerusalem to this day. But they destroyed the temple, they desecrated, and it was never rebuilt. We're talking about almost 2,000 years later, and the temple has not. And some people think, oh, it will be rebuilt from some Old Testament passages. No, no, no. There's no prediction that the temple will be rebuilt. Um, but he said, you know, this lawless one must come, leader of rebellion, who presents himself like God, a godlike figure. And so in almost every generation since then, there have been people who have presented themselves in that kind of way. You think of a Hitler in the last century who presented himself as the savior and messiah of Germany of an Aryan people, an imaginary people he cooked up in his own mind. And he led this terrible conflagration that caused millions of deaths. Uh, that's what lawless ones who claim to be God, but are godless, that's what they bring uh, on the world. And so the world's always filled with people, celebrities or political figures or other religious figures that claim for themselves the ultimate uh, and yet live in denial to that. So throughout history, there have been many antichrists. So there's not one antichrist. Anyone that exalts themselves and puts himself in the place of Christ or exalts themselves in their view of who Christ is that contradicts the real Christ is an antichrist. That's what he's saying here. And so that's why he can say there are many antichrists in the world at the time John is speaking. And so throughout the centuries, there have been many more, and there will be more to come as long as there is human existence. 
So I think that's a misunderstanding, like there's one Antichrist, when even John said in his time, there already were many Antichrists. Well, let's pick up what he further had to say back in 1 John chapter 2, uh, looking at verse 20 uh, to 25. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Bruce, what is, uh, what is meant by the anointed one? Um, yeah, it's interesting. He says here, uh, uh, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. Um, so what is this anointing that he refers to? Um, and again, the idea of anointing, uh, the word Christ means the anointed one. Um, and when it alludes to it happening in Jesus' life, it refers to when the Spirit comes on Jesus is his anointing. So it's not surprising we read <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, uh, some words that I think tell us a little bit about verse, uh, verses that 21 and 22 that tell us what the anointing is for us. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe Second Corinthians uh, uh, 1, beginning at 21. And it is God who, established, who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So notice he says, it's God that establishes us in Christ and has anointed us. How? He has put his seal on us, that's how he anointed us, and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So the anointing for Christians is that we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Literally, God dwells in us through the living presence of the Holy Spirit that we receive as a gift of baptism, which is an active work in our lives. Now, sometimes we don't, uh, you know, I think take as seriously as we should how important the Holy Spirit is uh, or understand really the role uh, that he has. But here he's telling these early Christians, you already know the truth. Well, how do you know the truth? You've received the anointing of the Spirit and the Spirit of God has been able to guide you in to the truth. Now, he goes on further to say, if you continue in what you had from the beginning. So what did they have from the beginning? The original gospel message about who Jesus was, how he come in this world in order to save men. So if they continue to abide in that original teaching about who Jesus was, then they would have the eternal life uh, that God had promised. But he warned them there were the Antichrist they were coming into this world to claim that Jesus was not the Christ. And so any denial of the true identity of Jesus, anyone that teaches that, whether they know it or not, they are a part of the Antichrist movement. They are opposed to God uh, because only the true Christ, the Christ of the Gospels, is a savior of the world. Uh, the other made up Christ or the substitutes for Christ cannot save and cannot deliver us. And so we've received the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, in Christ. And therefore, uh, God is at work uh, in our lives. Uh, whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So 
instead of denying the identity of Christ, his relationship to the Father, if we confess it, then we're in sync and we have fellowship with God and his son, Jesus Christ. And that's the message that we heard from the beginning. So these false teachers that have special secret knowledge, a new insight into who Jesus really is that contradicts what you originally heard, they are liars. And the truth is not in them. You already have the truth about who Jesus is. Now, you may not be living it as fully in your life as you can, but by the power of the spirit that God has given you, you can grow in your ability to live Christ in your life, but only by believing and holding to the authentic Christ whom the spirit represents uh, in our heart. And let's look at what John said in his gospel that I think would be helpful at this point. John 16, uh, verses 12 through 13. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all, all the truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So here, Jesus is describing to his disciples, I've got to leave, but I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to leave, and in my presence, I'm going to send the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the advocate, the spirit of truth. And what will this spirit do? He will guide you into all truth. So in two ways, the spirit has guided us into all truth. First of all, the spirit worked in the lives of the apostles and other writers of what we call the New Testament in order to give us an authentic, understanding of who Christ is and what authentic Christianity is, therefore a word of truth. The Spirit continues to work in us to help us, to guide us if we follow the guiding of the Spirit within us so that we will see that truth and stay with that truth. So the Spirit continues to work in our heart, in our lives, to keep us in line with that truth and to make sure we don't understand uh, that we can grow in our understanding uh, so that we can know the truth and live the truth. And so he reminds these Christians, you already have received the truth of God. It's about, you know, living out what you really know to be true. It's not some secret knowledge or some new Jesus that these false teachers that are the Antichrist. It's not the, the message they're selling that you need to hear. It's a lie, and all lies end up deceiving and eventually harming those who believe in them. And so he's exhorting them to not deny the Son, but to confess the Son, and to stick, abide in what they already know to be the truth. And if we do, then the promise that he made to us that we can have eternal life that begins now, that lasts forever, that that can be true for them, and it's true for us if we stick with the authentic Jesus that the apostles uh, presented to us, that we have in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the rest of the New Testament as it uh, builds out the what Jesus means for our life as, as a community of people, as a church. If we stick with the original truth, we're gonna be okay. If we start buying in to these people with their theories that speak to the spirit of the time, that seem to be relevant to what's going on right now, these kind of trends and fads come and go, and this Jesus they present that's false will be appealing and then he won't be appealing, but it's not the truth. So the important thing is we need to stick with the truth and not be deceived by any lies about who Jesus is and what his mission was for us. And let's uh, uh, look at one other uh, I think this is a passage I was uh, jumping to earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, because again, like I said, these antichrists that 
uh, John is writing about were Gnostics that were people caught up in Greek philosophy. Let's look at what uh, Paul said about these people and others uh, that were having difficulty accepting the message about Christ back in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. Verse 22, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. There's a whole lot said there in a very few verses and we can't really delve to the depths of it. But what he's saying here is, the Greeks were looking for philosophical wisdom. And the Jews were looking for signs. They were looking for powerful signs of God's divine plague to come upon the Romans and their other enemies. Um, and they were left waiting for those. Uh, and Greek philosophy came and went, morphed and changed. People are still looking for wisdom, some of them through higher and higher education. But God sent us the crucified Christ. It seems to contradict all our ideas about what it means to be successful, a winner, to triumph over evil. How, how is dying on a cross triumphing over evil? And of course, the resurrection answers that. But it seems foolishness to the Greeks that somehow God would do that. If God's going to come to the world, surely he would come and be a Plato philosopher, or for the Jews, he'd be some military leader like Joshua or like Moses. But no, he comes and is a humble servant of the Lord who allows the enemy, even at the behest of his own people, to be crucified, mockingly called the king of the Jews. That's how God intends to save the world. It may seem foolish to men, uh, but God's foolishness is wiser than all the wisdom of men. And the weakness of God is seeing the sense of being the crucified one. In that we see the profound strength of God, God's profound love. And it took the sacrifice of his son the giving up of the righteous one for the wicked so that you and I could have the hope of eternal life. So John's trying to bring them back to the crucified Christ, to the real Christ, to the Jesus who is the Christ, for the one that came in the flesh and who God raised from the dead. Uh, that's the one you heard from the beginning, and that's the only one that will end up at the end of days giving you eternal life uh, when everything is said and done. And let's look at the two more uh, verses to wrap up this section, verse 26 and 27 of 1 John chapter 2. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Bruce, how do we keep from being deceived? Yeah, so his concern, the reason why he wrote what he did, was to warn them that there were deceivers. There was antichrist uh, in the world that were seeking to uh, undermine the will, will and purpose of God. Don't, don't worry, it's my phone and Becky's running somewhere in the house trying to find where that phone is. Uh, someone's calling, but ah, she got it. So that's a ringing phone. But notice here, he says, you don't really need anybody to teach you. You've already received the spirit. And again, think of the early church. You know, the Spirit of God was the primary source. The scriptures were only in the process of being written. And so they had to depend on the guidance of the Spirit to keep them in line. 
But he's saying, look, you already know everything you need to know. You just need to stay focused on that and not get deceived. And so the question is, how do we keep from being deceived? Number one, we stay in the word of God and we learn the word of God. So we know the difference between what the word of God teaches and what men might teach about God. But secondly, uh, in the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter three is where I'd like for us to look at a concluding thought. Verse 12, take care brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So here he says, you know, beware of the deceitfulness of sin. These false teachers that John was talking about were giving them a totally misleading understanding of the nature of sin and were causing them to become enslaved to sin again if you bought into their teaching where Christ has set us free from sin and set us on a course of righteousness and doing the will of God. And so he's exhorting them uh, here in Hebrews, a whole book warning against apostasy, don't develop this unbelieving heart. Well, how do you develop an unbelieving heart? By allowing sin to deceitfully become an important part of your life and to harden your heart, therefore, to others, to God, and to his word. So what can we do? We need to exhort or encourage one another daily as long as called today uh, so that this hardening can't take place. For if we have come to share in Christ, which we have, if we hold our original confidence firm to the end, we're good to go. We just need to hold firm to what we believe to the end and not be led off into some false set of beliefs. And we partially do that by having other brothers and sisters involved in our life. And if we start getting off course, they'll be able to detect that and warn us and encourage us to get back on the road, get back on the road of righteousness, get back to a right relationship with God through Christ, encouraging us to confess our sins and to confess Christ for who he really is. And that's why we need a close Christ community. We need people to whom we're sharing what we believe and what we're doing and how we're living and getting input from other people. That's how you stay in a right relationship with God. But if you get off as a lone ranger doing your own thing, I'll just conclude with this illustration. When I moved to Denver, Colorado in like 1977, there was this really gung-ho uh, young man in the congregation. Back then, they, they had a very dynamic bus ministry, and they're picking up lots of kids and studying with their parents and converting a lot of people. And this guy was a really gung-ho guy uh, for Jesus, but he couldn't get along with people. So I hadn't been there but a few months, and he got irritated with the elders and other people, and so he left. And for a while, he went to this church and that. And eventually, he quit going to church at all because no church was righteous enough. None of them agreed with him. But he didn't need them. He lived, you know, lived the life, Christian life all by himself as a devout follower. Literally, uh, over time, and this is, say, about six or seven years, he literally became insane. He lost all sense of reality. Uh, he was reading the Bible one time, and he thought God had told him, just like Abraham was to sacrifice his son. He was to kill his wife and his children. And he took a knife and tried to kill his wife. This guy in five or six years went from being a gung-ho, evangelistic, share his faith, live for Jesus person. He got isolated off in his own little world. Uh, no Christian fellowship. He gradually, literally became insane. And I was called over to his parents' house. He had just confessed that he had killed his wife. And he wanted me there to pray for him. And I came over 
and the detectives from the police surrounded the house and came in the house and arrested him and took him off. But I look at him, he went in such a short period of time from being such a uh, fired up follower of Jesus to being an insane person who wanted to kill his own wife and children. And thanks to God, he didn't succeed. He tried to kill her, but didn't. Um, this is what happens when you get isolated. Now, that's a worst case scenario. But I'm telling you, if he'd stayed in the fellowship, he would have never gotten to that position. People would have seen some sort of drifting in his thinking and would have been able to correct him. But when you're on your own, it's easy to be misled, even in your own reading of scripture as he was. So let us learn lessons from other people's bad mistakes. Uh, let's draw close to God, close to one another. Let's stick with the word of God and brothers and sisters that love the word of God. And then we can be confident that we're looking forward to eternal life, living forever with one another in the kingdom of God. That's what we look forward to. And we can have confidence about that because we're staying with what we know to be true, the real Jesus with the real life that he offers. John, would you lead us in a prayer of, of uh, praise and honor to God for what he's done for us that we might keep uh, firmly to the end the faith uh, that we have in him. Father, we humbly approach your throne, Lord, giving you all the honor, all the glory. We acknowledge that you are God and beside you there is truly none other. We thank you for giving us a way back to you through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. We we thank you for his obedience to the death of Calvary's cross to save sinners like us. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is truly our guide and our comfort into all truths. And Father, we thank you that we have this fellowship of family, a family on this time side of life. And while we live in this physical body, we live as eternal family members looking forward to the day that your son returns and welcomes us back into your glory. Father, we pray that we continue to rally around each other, that the deceivers will not have any power over us, that our fellowship will be strong, that we will lift each other up where we're torn down. And Father, that we can walk uh, in strength, firmly holding to the truth of your son, Jesus. But we thank you for Bruce and his ability to teach so clearly. We thank you for all of the souls here live and those who are watching the recorded version of this wonderful lesson. We thank you for the power of your word, for it is in Jesus' name this prayer is asked. Amen. Amen.